Hello everybody, my name is Antonina Brukova. Today is Saturday and I'll tell you the fairy tale Sambalina. There once was a woman who wanted so very much to have a tiny little child. But she did not know where to find one. So she went to an old witch and she said, I have set my heart upon having a tiny little child. Please, could you tell me where I can find one? Why, that's easily done, said the witch. Here is a grain of barley for you. But it isn't at all the sort of barley that farmers grow in their fields or that the chicken gets to eat. Put it in a flower pot and you will see what you will shell. Oh, thank you, the woman said. She gave the witch twenty pennies and planted the barley seed as soon as she got home. It quickly grew into a fine, large flower, which looked very much like a tulip, but the petals were folded tight as though it were still a bud. This is such a pretty flower, said the woman. She kissed its lovely red and yellow petals, and just as she kissed it, the flower gave a loud paw and flew open. It was a tulip, right enough, but on the green cushion in the middle of it sat a tiny girl. She was dainty, dainty and fair to see, but she was no taller than your thumb. So she was called Sambalina. A nicely polished walnut shell served as her cradle. Her mattress was made of a blue petals of violets, and a rose petal was pulled up to cover her. That was how she sleep slept at night. In the daytime, she played on the table, where the woman put a plate surrounded with a wreath of flowers. Their stems lay in the water, on which there floated a large tulip petal. Thumbelina used the paddle as a boat and with a pair of white horse hairs for oars, she could row clear across the plate, a charming sight. She could sing too. Her voice was so softest and sweetest that anyone ever had heard. One night, as she lay in her cradle, a horrible toad hopped in through a window one of the Pains was broken. This big, ugly, slimy toad jumped right down on the table where Thumbelina was asleep under the red rose petal. Here is a perfect wife for my son, the toad exclaimed. She seized upon the walnut shell in which Thumbelina lay asleep and hopped off with it out the window and into the garden. The big, broad stream ran through it with a muddy marsh along its banks, and here the toad lives with her son. Ugh! He was just like his mother, slim and horrible. Cocks, cocks, break a cax! was all that he could say when he saw the graceful little girl in the walnut shell. Don't speak so loud, or you will wake her up. The old toad told him, she might get away from us yet, for she is as light as a puff of swanstone. We must have put on one of the broad water lily leaves out in the stream. She is so small and light that it will be just like an island to her, and she can't run away from us while we are making our best room under the mud ready for you two to live in. Many water lilies with broad green leaves grew in the stream, and it looked as if they were floating on the surface. The leaf which lay furthest from the bank was the largest of them all, and it was to this leaf that the old toad swam with the walnut shell which held Sambalina. The poor little thing woke up early next morning, and, the, and when she saw where she was, she began to cry bitterly. 
There was water all around the big green leaf, and there was nowhere at all for her to reach the shore. The old toad sat in the mud, decorating a room with green rushes and yellow water lilies, to have it looking its best for her new daughter-in-law. Then she and her ugly son swam out to live on which Thumbelina was standing. They came for the pretty little bed which they wanted to carry to the bridal chamber before they took her there. The old toad curtis deep in the water before her and said, Meet my son. He is to be your husband and you will share a delightful home in the mud. Quox, quox, bracky, gax, was all that her son could say. Then they took the pretty little bed and swam away with it. Left all alone on the green leaf, Thumbelina sat down and cried. She did not want to live in a slimy toad's house, and she didn't want to have the toad's horrible son for her husband. The little fishes who swam in the water beneath her had seen the toad and heard what she had said. So up popped their heads to have a look at a little girl. No sooner had they seen her than they felt very sorry that anyone so pretty should have to go down to live with that hideous toad. No, that should never be. They gathered around the green stem which held the leaf where she was and gnawed it in two with their teeth. Away went the leaf down the stream, and away went Thumbelina, far away where the toad could not catch her. Thumbelina sailed past many a place, and when the little birds in the bushes saw her, they sing, What a darling little girl! The leaf drifted further and further away with her, and so it was that Thumbelina became a traveler. A lovely white butterfly kept flying around her and at last alighted on the leaf because she admired Thumbelina. She was a happy little girl again, now that the toad could not catch her. It was all very lovely as she floated along and where the sun struck the water it looked like shining gold. Thumbelina undid her sash tied one end of it to the butterfly and made the other end fast to the leaf. It went much faster now. The Thumbelina went much faster too, for of course she was standing on it. Just then a big maybug flew by and catch sight on her. Immediately he fastened his claws around her slender waist and flew with her up into a tree. Away went the green leaf down the stream, and away went the butterfly with it, for he was tied to the leaf and could not get loose. My goodness, how frightened little Thumbelina was when Maybob carried her up to the tree. But she was even more sorry for the nice white butterfly she had fastened to the leaf, because if he couldn't free himself, he would have to starve to death. But the maybug wasn't one to care about that. He set her down on the largest green leaf of the tree, fed her honey from the flowers and told her how pretty she was, considering that she didn't look the least little a maybug. After a while, all the other maybugs who lived in the tree came to pay them a call. As they star at the Thumbelina, the lady may box threw up their feelers and said, Why, she has only two legs. What a miserable sight. She hasn't any feelers, one cried. She is pitched in at the waist how harmful. She looked like a human being. How ugly she is, said all of the female maybugs. Yet, Thumbelina was as pretty as ever, 
Even the Maybach who had flown away with her knew that, but as every last one of them kept calling her ugly, he at length came to agree with them and would have nothing to do with her, she could go wherever she chose. They flew down out of the tree with her and left her on a daisy, where she sat and cried because she was so ugly that the Maybox wouldn't have anything to do with her. Nevertheless, she was the loveliest little girl you can imagine, and as frail and fine as the petal of a rose. All summer long, poor Thumbelina lived all alone in the woods. She wove herself a hammock of grass and hung it under a big burdock leaf to keep off the rain. She took honey from the flowers for food and drank the dew which she found on the leaves every morning. In this way the summer and fall went by. Then came the winter, the long cold winter. All the birds who had sung so sweetly for her flew away. The trees and the flowers withered. The big burdock leaf under which she had lived shrilled up until nothing was left of it but a dry yellow stalk. She was terribly cold, for her clothes had worn threadbare and she herself was so slender and frail. Poor Thumbelina! She would freeze to death. Snow began to fall, and every time a snowflake struck her, it was as if she had been hit by a hole so full, for we are quite tall while she measured only an inch. She wrapped a withered leaf about her, but there was no warmth in it. She shivered with cold. Near the edge of the woods, where she now had arrived, was a large grain field, but, she, but the grain had been harvested long ago. Only the dry bare stubble stuck out of the frozen ground. It was just as if she were lost in a vast forest. And oh, how she shivered with cold. Then she came to the door of a field mouse who had a little hole amid the stubble. There these mouse lived, warm and cozy, with a whole storeroom of grain and a magnificent kitchen and pantry. Poor Thumbelina stood at the door just like a beggar child and pled for a little bit of barley because she hadn't had anything to eat for two days past. Why? You poor little thing, said the field mouse, who turned out to be a kind-hearted old creature. You must come into my warm room and share my dinner. She took such a fancy to Thumbelina that she said, If you care to, you may stay with me all winter, but you must keep my room tidy and tell me story, for I am very fond of them. Thumbelina did as the kind old field mouse asked, and she had a very good time of it. Soon we shall have a visitor, the field mouse said. Once every week my neighbor comes to see me, and he is even better off than I am. His rooms are large, and he wears such a beautiful black velvet coat. If you could only get him for a husband, you would be well taken care of. But he can't see anything. You must tell him the very best story you know. Thumbelina did not like this suggestion. She would not even consider the neighbor, because he was a mole. He paid them a visit in his black velvet coat. The field mouse talked about how wealthy and wise he was and how his home was more than 20 times larger than her. But for all of his knowledge, he cared nothing at all for the sun and the flowers. He had nothing good to say for them and had never laid eyes on them. 
as Thumbelina had to sing for him, she sang, May bug, may bug, fly away home, and the monk goes afield, the mole fell in love with her sweet voice, but he didn't say anything about it yet, for he was a most discreet fellow. He has just dug a long tunnel through the ground from his house to theirs, and the field mouse and Thumbelina were invited to use it whenever they pleased, though he warned them not to be al alarmed by the dead bird which lay in this passage. It was a complete bird, with feather and beak. It must have died quite recently when winter set in, and it was buried right in the middle of the tunnel. The mole took in his mouth a torch of decayed wood. In the darkness it glimmered like fire. He went ahead of them to light the way through the long, dark passage. When they came to the very dead bird lay, the mole put his broad nose to the sailing and made a large hole through which daylight could fall. In the middle of the floor lay a dead swallow, with his lovely wings folded at his sides and his head tucked under his feathers. The poor bird must certainly have died of the cold. Sambalina felt so sorry for him. She loved all the little birds who had sung and sweetly twittered to her all through the summer. But the mole gave the body a kick with these short stumps and said, Now he won't be chirping anymore. What a wretched thing it is to be born a little girl. Thank goodness none of my children can be a bird who has nothing but his chirp chirp. You must starve to death when winter comes alone. Yes, you're so right. You're sensible man, the field mouse agreed. What good is all his chirp chirping to a bird in the winter time when he starves and freezes, but that's considered very grain, I imagine. Thumbelina kept silent. But when the others turned their back on the bird, she bent over, smoothed aside the feathers that hid the bird's head, and kissed his lovely eyes. Maybe it was he who sang so sweetly to me in the summertime, she thought to herself. What pleasure he gave me, the dear pretty bird. The mole closed up the hole that led in the daylight, and then he took the ladies home. That night, Thumbelina could not sleep a wink, so she got up and wove a fine large coverlet out the hay. She took it to the dead bird and spread it over him, so that he would lie warm in the cold earth. She tucked him in with some sort Sinsle down that she had found in the field mouse house. Goodbye, you pretty little bird, she said. Goodbye, and thank you for your sweet songs last summer, when the trees were all green and the sun shone so warmly upon us. She laid her head on his breast, and it startled her to feel a sort sum, as if something were beating inside. This was the bird's heart. He was not dead. He was only numb with cold. And now that he had been warmed, he came to life again. In the fall, all swallows fly off to warm countries. But if one of them starts too late, he gets so cold that he drops down as if he were dead and lies where he fell. And then the cold snow cows with. Thumbelina was so frightened that she trembled, for the bird was so big, so enormous compared to her own inch of hate. But she mustered her courage, tucked the cotton wool down close around the poor bird, brought the mint leaf that covered her over bed, 
and spread it over the bird's head. The following night she tiptoed out to him again. He was alive now, but so weak that he could barely open his eyes for a moment to look at Sambalina, who stood beside him with a piece of touchwood that was her only lantern. Thank you, pretty little child, the sick swallow said. I have been wonderfully warmed. Soon I shall get strong once more and be able to fly away in the warm sunshine. Oh, yes, she said. It's cold outside. It's snowing and freezing. You just stay in your warm bed and I'll nurse you. Then she brought him some water in the petal of the flower. The swallow drank and told her how he had hurt one of his wings in the thorn brush. And uh, for that reason couldn't fly as fast as other swallows when they flew far, far away from the warm countries. Finally, he had dropped to the ground. That was all he remembered. And he had no idea how he came to be where she found him. The swallow stayed there all through the winter and Sambalina was kind to him and tended him with loving care. She didn't say anything about this to the field mouse or to the mole because they didn't like the poor unfortunate swallow. As soon as spring came and the sun warmed the earth, the swallow told Sambalina it was time to say goodbye. She reopened the hole that the mole had made in the sailing, and the sun shone in splendor upon them. The swallow asked Sambalina to go with him. She could sit on his back as they flew away through the green woods, but Sambalina knew that it would make the one old field mouse feel badly as she left like that. So she said, no, I can't go. Fare you well, fare you well, my good and pretty girl, said the swallow as he flew into the sunshine. Tears came into Thumbelina's eyes as she watched him go for the... for she was so fond of poor swallow. Chop, chop, sang the bird as he flew into the green woods. Sambalina felt very downcast. She was not permitted to go out in the warm sunshine. Moreover, the grain that was sown in the field above the field mouse's house grew so tall that to a poor little girl who was only an inch height. It was like a dense forest. You must work on your treasure this summer, the field mouse said for their neighbor that loathsome mole in his black velvet coat had proposed to her. You must have both woolens and linens, both bedding and wardrobe when you become the mole's wife. Zambelina had to turn the spindle and the field mouse hired for spiders to spin and uh, weave for her day and night. The mole came to her to call every evening, and this favorite remark was that the sun, which now baked the earth as hard as a rock, would not be nearly so hot when summer was over. Yes, as soon as summer was past, he would be married to Sambalina. But she was not at all happy about it, because she didn't like the tender small the least bit. Every morning at sunrise and every evening at sunset she would steal out the door. When the breeze blew the ears of grain apart, she could catch glimpses of the blue sky. She could dream about how bright and faint was out of doors and how she wished she would see her dear swallow again. But he did not come again for doubtless he was far away, flying about in the lovely green woods. When fall arrived, Thumbelina's whole treasure was ready. 
Your wedding day is four weeks off, the field mouse told her. But Thumbelina cried and declared that she would not have the tedious smile for a husband. Fiddlestick, said Ma field mouse, don't you be obstinate or I'll bite you with my white teeth. Why you are getting a superb husband? The queen herself hasn't a black velvet coat as fine as his. Both his kitchen and his cellar are well supplied. You ought to thank Godness that you are getting him. Then came a wedding day. The mole had come to take Zambalina home with him, where she would have to live deep underground and never go out in the warm sunshine again, because he disliked it so. The poor little girl felt very sad that she had to say goodbye to the glorious sun which the field mouse had at least let her look out at through the doorway. Farewell, bright sun, she said, with her arm stretched towards it. She walked a little way from the field mouse's house. The grain had been harvested, the, and only the dry stubble was left in the field. Farewell, farewell, she cried again, and flung her little arms around a small red flower <clears throat> that was still in bloom. If you see my dear swallow, please give him my love. Chop, 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 chop. She suddenly heard a twittering over her head. She looked up and there was the swallow just passing by. He was so glad to see Thumbelina, although when she told him how she hated to marry the mole and live deep underground where the sun never shone, she could not help back her tears. Now that the cold winter is coming, <clears throat> the swallow told her, I shall fly far, far away to warm countries. Won't you come along with me? You can ride on my back. Just tie yourself on with your sash and away we'll fly. Far from the ugly mole and his dark hole, far, far away over the mountains to the warm countries where the sun shines so much fairer than here, to where it is always summer and where are always flowers. Please, fly away with me, dear little Thumbelina, you who saved my life when I lay frozen in a dark hole in the earth. Yes, I will go with you, said Thumbelina. She sat on his back, put her feet on his outstretched wings and fastened her sash to one of his strong, strongest feathers. Then the swallow soared into the air over forests and over lakes, high up over the great mountains that are always crept with snow. When Thumbelina felt cold in the chill air, she crept under the bird's warm feather, with only her little head stuck out to the watch all the wonderful sights below. At length they came to the warm countries. There the sun shone far more brightly than it ever does here, and the sky seemed twice as high along the di ditches and had hedgerows grew marvelous green and blue grapes. Lemons and oranges hung in the woods. The air smelled sweetly of myrtle and song. By the wayside the loveliest child ran hither and thither, playing with the brightly colored butterflies. But the swallow flew on still farther, and it became more and more beautiful, and the magnificent green trees on the shore of a blue lake, there stood an ancient palace of dazzling white marble. The lofty pillars were rest with vines, and at the top of them many swallows had made their nests. One nest belonged to the swallow who carried Thumbelina. This is my home, the swallow told her. If you will choose one of those glorious flowers and bloom down below, I shall place you in it, 
and you will have all that your heart, is, heart desires. That will be lovely, she cried and clapped her tiny hands. A great white marble pillar had fallen to the ground, where it lay in the three broken pieces. Between these pieces grew the loveliest large white flowers. The swallow flew down with Thumbelina and put her on one of the largest petals. How surprised she was to find in the center of the flower a little man. As shining and transparent as if he had been made of glass. On his head there was a dentist, a little god crowns, on his shoulders were the brightest shining wings, and he was not a bit bigger than Thumbelina. He was the spirit of flower. In every flower there lived a small man or woman just like him, but he was the king over all of them. Oh, isn't he handsome? Thumbelina said softly to the swallow. The king was somewhat afraid of the swallow, which seemed a very giant of a bird to anyone as small as he. But when he saw Thumbelina, he rejoiced, for she was so prettiest little girl he had ever laid eyes on. So he took off his golden crown and put it on her head. He asked if he might know her name, and he asked her to be his wife which would make her queen over all the flowers. Here, indeed, was a dif different sort of husband from the toad son and the mole with his black velvet coat. So she said yes to this charming king. From all the flowers trooped little ladies and gentlemen, lightful to behold. Every one of them brought Thumbelina a present. But the best gift of all was a pair of wings that had belonged to a large silver fly. When they were made fast to her back, she too could flit from flower to flower. Everyone rejoiced as the swallow perched above them in his nest and sang his very best song for them. He was sad though, deep down in his heart for he life. Thumbelina so much that he wanted never to part with her. You shall no longer be called Thumbelina, the flower spirit told her. That name is too ugly for anyone as pretty as you are. We shall call you Maya. Goodbye, goodbye, said the uh, swallow. He flew away again from the warm countries back to far away Denmark where he had a little nest over the window of the man who can tell you fairy tales. To him the bird sang chop 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 and that's how we heard the whole story. So if you like my fairy tale please put some up and see you next Saturday. Goodbye, see you.